there is no subject or subjectivity other than the becoming itself. This is Acid Horizon, and in this video, we will offer a brief look at Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's concept of becoming, particularly their concept of becoming animal as it is laid out in the plateau 1730, becoming intense, becoming animal, becoming imperceptible from a thousand plateaus. Beyond what will be a very abridged summary of the plateau, we will highlight the ethical stakes and the political importance of a very rich and unusual piece of philosophical writing. At the top of the video, we sung a refrain that will carry us through. There is no subject or subjectivity other than the becoming itself. We'll keep this sentence in mind as we address the following questions. Very broadly, how has our relationship with animals and notions of animality impacted the way we think about personal identity, political agency, and our political subjectivity? How does the concept of becoming animal intend to surpass other philosophical notions of the animal? And finally, how can Deleuze and Guattari's concept of becoming or becoming animal help us to overcome the social apparatuses that turn us into subjects useful for maintaining the existing political order. To get a sense of what the authors are trying to do in this plateau, it is important to look at a larger problematic in their work, which is their critique of representation. Deleuze and Guattari reject the idea that, in the last instance, life or our lives are ultimately representable and that there exists a transcendent metaphysics of representation which undergirds any such view. In an early essay entitled Plato in the Simulacrum, Deleuze takes aim at Plato's theory of ideas. Plato's assertion that the universe consists of idealized image idols and a hierarchy of expressions or instantiations of ideas, which either approximate them as likenesses or resemblances, or which fall from grace as bad representations, phantasms, or false copies of the idea. For Plato, there is surely an idea of an ideal ruler or statesman, and through a sound process of deduction, we could determine who among sovereigns, alive or dead, would best fit the mold. The problem for Deleuze and for Plato himself, in fact, is that Plato's methodology, or what is called his method of division, tends to run aground, leaving old Plato's arguments stuck in the rut of aporia. In the Platonic dialogue entitled Statesman, Plato attempts to pull out of the ruts and overcome theoretical dead ends by making recourse to mythological narratives. Deleuze criticizes this move, arguing that the appeals to myth just lodge us in another explanatory cul-de-sac that presupposes what it fails to explain philosophically. A consequence of accepting Plato's incoherent theory of ideas is a suppression of the singularity of the lives of things leaving them under the weight of a transcendent notion of what a good life or a good thing ought to be. In essence, if we believe that an ideal can or should serve to stand in for an existing being, we become stuck in the trap of representation. An outgrowth of representation has been the elevation of the concept of man as a kind of eminent term in the history of Western philosophy. Man, in one view, is the mature form of the child. He is also conceived as the rational counterpart to the woman whom, for example, is sometimes said to be more easily confounded by the vagaries of emotion. Man is also the creature with an immortal soul, as Aquinas writes, unlike the animals over which he has dominion. These hierarchies or binary constructions in which man is situated as the dominant term tend to function on a progress-regress continuum. In other words, a sort of evolutionary view of man situated in contrast to subordinate figures. In this view, the anthropomorphic and masculinist aspects of a category are valorized, and its opposing pole is rendered subordinate. In other words, the value of a being or object depends on its attributes or its participation in categories with respect to the dominant term, man. Whether the attributes of a person or a thing are measured in terms of scale or category, the conceptual hierarchy relegates those attributes that fail to measure up. Moreover, the binary structure of the hierarchy always produces an excess or series of ambiguous border cases which tend to frustrate it. 
The way to reclaim those attributes, aspects, or dimensions of someone or something which are lost under the evolutionary continuum of a concept is to involute it. To break down the evolutionist polarity by short-circuiting the dominant term in the series by manifesting a radically new relational quality to the subordinate term in the hierarchy. The involution in turn allows a new line to form, one free from the organizing mandate of a series of imposed binaries. Life becomes freed from the insistent solidity of structured forms of subjectivity and escapes the demand for discreteness in the order of things. Once again, we return to our refrain. There is no subject or subjectivity other than the becoming itself. This brings us to an important but sometimes underemphasized figure in the work of Deleuze and Guattari, Carl Jung. In The Becoming Animal Plateau, the authors point to Jung's theory of archetypes as a significant intervention in the way we consider animals or images of animals. For Jung, an archetype is a timeless mythological motif which appears in dreams, fantasies, and works of fiction. Jung believed that the appearance of these images intimated the vagaries of our personal and collective unconscious life. The archetypes, unlike Freud's figure of Oedipus or the mommy-daddy-me triangle, comprise a diverse pantheon of gods and a bestiary of mythical creatures. Deleuze and Guattari write that the theory of archetypes displaced the figure of man, complicating the hierarchical relationship between the human image and the animal image. However, despite the advent of Jung's theory, Deleuze and Guattari believe that Jung's method nonetheless leaves the trap of representation intact due to its dependence on the notion of resemblance. For example, imagine a session of Jungian psychoanalysis in which the analysand, or the dreamer, brings an animal dream to the analyst. The analyst listens to the dream in an attempt to identify its archetypal situation. Together, the analyst and the analysand then navigate a series of interpretations in conjunction with its archetypal coordinates. Archetypal narratives which elicit the most resonance are those most likely to produce a meaning significant to the dreamer. While this method may satisfy some of the demands of therapy, it risks constraining the dreamer's experience of animality to a symbolic order. The intensity and life of the dream may simply become tagged with reference to a set of existing meanings from waking life. Thus, the dream singularity is often lost to its becoming rendered as a meaning. Archetypal psychologist James Hillman, whose career began under Jung's tutelage, levels precisely this criticism at the Jungian tradition. Both Hillman and Deleuze and Guattari endeavor to find a new way to relating to animals and the animal image which hurdles over the black hole of resemblances, meanings, and what we might more generally call interpretations. Now, another important convergence between the thought of Hillman and that of Deleuze and Guattari is the lament that therapy has taken the place of politics. In short, we have invested the therapeutic space with a libidinal charge and social importance once reserved for political action. Psychotherapy, dream analysis, and other lineages of therapeutic cultures that came out of the 20th century largely depoliticized social struggles by locating the symptom in personal pathologies and by directing our collective focus towards the task of individual growth and development. However, as a psychoanalyst himself, Felix Guattari was keen on some of Jung's familiar methods. And Deleuze, in his early work, celebrated what he saw as Jung's theoretical improvements upon Freud's work. It is clear that Deleuze and Guattari maintained an ambition to push the creativity of figures like Carl Jung and Gaston Bachelard onto a firmly political terrain, transforming their work into new questions. How do we confront the alterity of real animals or the animal image in such a way to escape what's most oppressive about being human? How do we elevate the sense of othering that an encounter with animals or an animal image produces to the level of a political experiment? The authors write, Becoming's animal are neither dreams nor fantasies. They are perfectly real. But which reality is at issue here? For if becoming animal does not consist in playing animal or imitating an animal, it is clear that the human being does not really become an animal any more than the animal really becomes something else. 
Becoming produces nothing other than itself. Becoming produces nothing other than itself. How can we unpack that? Perhaps the most helpful example to understand this sentence can be found in the very first paragraphs of the Becoming Animal Plateau. Deleuze and Guattari recall the 1972 horror classic Willard. Willard Stiles is a 27-year-old social outcast who lives with his mother. Following a surprise birthday party thrown for him at home, Willard's mother instructs him to exterminate some rats menacing their suburban property. Instead, Willard ends up befriending the uncannily intelligent vermin just before a series of tragedies befalls him. In the wake of his mother's death, Willard is left with onerous financial obligations and other responsibilities. Moreover, troubles at work abound and things just seem to get worse for him. Amidst his challenges, Willard attempts to grasp onto the very things that one might say would have made the average American man of the 1970s. Reliable employment, a house in one's name, and viable prospects for a romantic partner. However, the vermin assemblage with whom Willard has forged an alliance continues to thwart his attempts to secure these markers of social status. In one instance, the Legion of Rats go as far to ruin his chances with a potential love interest. It seems the Rat Pack intervenes wherever and wherever Willard is on the cusp of committing himself to a social role that would render him into the existential bondage of life under capitalism. However, through his alliance with the Rats, Willard engenders a new set of sensibilities and affects which force a break with the normalizing social processes of life in the late 20th century. Here and elsewhere, Deleuze and Guattari use the term Oedipalization to describe the form of social inscription that occurs via the institutions of family, church, work, psychoanalysis, popular media, and so on. All of the institutions which serve to recuperate the forces of capitalist exploitation and the hegemony of the state. At last, Willard did not become a rat, nor did he seek to imitate them. But his alliance with the creatures led to forestalling those apparatuses which capture human desire and turn us into docile subjects. Well, we're just about at the end of the video, and you might still be wondering why a concept of animality would be theoretically necessary or even useful for creating a revolutionary political assemblage. Well, consider how notions such as rationality and humanism have attended to some of the most anthropocentric, dehumanizing, racist, and environmentally destructive acts of human violence. Philosopher Claire Colebrook, in her book Death of the Post-Human, uses the work of Deleuze and Guattari to claim that the fabrication we call humanity is a figure produced through man's neurotic grip on its own concept of itself. She writes that the divisions we have constructed between races and species have been intended to repel the prospect of humanity's extinction by defining what is properly human. The figure of an ideal humanity has been buttressed by the subjugation of humans and animals alike, those considered less than ideal. I mean, just consider the institution of slavery throughout history and the ongoing exploitation of animals through factory farming or the ways that we exploit the environment. Furthermore, consider the premises or justifications for why those institutions were allowed to persist. The irony, of course, is that the various forms of exploitation spawned from the logic of this collective neurosis continues to wreak havoc on the global ecosystem needed to sustain all of us. Becoming animal, on the other hand, involves breaking with this logic in an effort to embody those intensities which have been relegated or suppressed by the so-called rational order. Deleuze and Guattari believe that the movement of becoming involves engendering new affects and new ways of seeing out of which prospects for new paradigms manifest. However, where the rational order continues to insist upon its own tenuous solidity and the categories by which it maintains the order of things, Deleuze and Guattari respond that there is no subject or subjectivity other than the becoming itself. And it is through these becomings that a new political freedom can be realized. In the end, the most important question surrounding the concept of becoming animal is how we might be able to formulate new political experiments. How do we create alliances akin to the animal becomings of Willard Stiles, break with the order of things, 
and perhaps inspire something truly revolutionary. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to support us, please first subscribe to our Patreon account for as little as $1 a month. Also, we have multiple publications on repeater books. Pick up The Philosopher's Tarot or pick up Anti-Oculus, where we talk a little bit more about this concept of becoming animal. Okay, take care. Thank you.